another working day for Jack Jones, a bus drover in Queensland. And for the wiry Bluey from Udna. Another working day for Jack Jones, a bus drover in Queensland. And for the wiry Bluey from Udnadatta. The stockman George Thompson, 30 years a drover. So the day starts, just like any other. From the moment the Australian legend began to solidify, the Bushman had become the centre of this portrait of Australia. But always in the background, never the initiator of events, never the centre of action, was the Australian woman. Sometimes in the literature that is our history, she was present merely as a cipher, but more often she was simply left out of the story altogether. Like the drover's wife, she waited, waited for the man to come and make sense out of her life. Russell Ward in The Australian Legend set out to describe the emergence of the Australian national character and he identified this as forming in the 19th century in the context of the pastoral industry, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland. And at the heart of this Australian character was the Bushman, the distinctive national type whom Francis Adams had identified in the 1880s and 1890s. What I thought when I was rereading Ward was that in this national type that he describes, in the identification of the Bushman, there's a celebration of the distinctive style of masculinity which is at odds with another style of masculinity which is being promoted at exactly the same time by the feminist movement in the cities in the 1880s and 1890s. In other words, when Ward sets out to describe the national character, he finds the Bushman, who already has been created as a type by the writers in the 1880s and 1890s. And Ward is not at all conscious of the sex of his subject, you know, he just equates the national character with this particular Bushman, not seeing that in fact the writers he's talking about and he, Ward, in the 1950s, is celebrating a model of masculinity. That is that they're not just masculine or about masculinity, they're actually pushing certain things in men's interests, that certain patterns of life certain ideas are in men's interests and often at the expense of women and that history had been written so far as if there hadn't been such masculinist projects somehow you know it was only that feminist projects were identifiable not masculinist ones and i thought that this was a good case both the writing of the 1880s and 1890s you know often actually positioned women as the enemies of men's freedom as the enemy full stop um, and that they were promoting sort of freedoms and privileges of men that had deleterious consequences for women and children. And Ward himself, in a way, um, could be said to be a masculinist writer in that he too is celebrating certain patterns of masculine behaviour and then saying that they're the Australian ones, they're the national ones. And in that way, either making women completely invisible or else marginalising them or else, as I say, setting them up as killjoys, really, as the sort of enemy of men's freedom and fun. You have a mic over there with a the pawpaw. You have a couple of sausages, mate. There, Ward. The barbecue offers the illusion of a raw, natural world, barely kept at bay. It puts the male briefly, but firmly, back into the role of hunter and leader. Nowhere better than at the barbecue is the ideology of the tribal Australian male painlessly celebrated. <sighs> That's better. At the end of every story, it seems, the man provides and the little woman tends to the home and bears fruit, somewhere in the background, away from the real action. Women have attempted to enter mainstream culture or to enter the concept of the nation in various ways, and they've usually swung between asserting their difference, if you like, as women, and asserting their sameness or similarity with men. And it's interesting that we are able to look back and look at the consequences of this and find that women are in a no-win situation in many ways. In the 1910s and 20s, women promoted motherhood as their special vocation and they promoted women's capacities um, and abilities to care and to nurture. But the project also rebounds on women, having asserted their difference as mothers, 
then this is used against them in the 1930s depression when they're told that as mothers they have no place in the workforce when the few jobs that are available should be for men etc etc and thereafter feminists give up that ploy altogether they sort of jettison that strategy of difference and thereafter take up equal pay equal opportunity those sorts of claims that we're more familiar with because in a way we are at the end of that new strategy of asserting women's similarity to men our, our equal rights um, with men to work, to pay through the workforce, etc. And none of those projects um, will ever be fully satisfactory as long as the terms of national life are defined on men's terms. Henry Lawson's story of the drover's wife stands at the centre of the debates surrounding the historical and literary construction of women. Lawson himself tended to view women generally as a force preventing men from great deeds. Women weren't just seen as unimportant but often as actually hindering men. Later in his life, Lawson began to see women as actively antagonistic, a threat to men's power. The clever scoundrels are all outside, and the moneyless mugs in jail. Men do 12 months for a mad wife's lies, or life for a strumpet's tail. And the cackling, screaming, half-human hens who are never mothers or wives and send their sisters to such a hell for the term of their natural lives, where laws are made in a female fit to the land of the crazy fad, and the drunkards in judgment on drunkards sit, and the mad condemn the mad. By about 1902, all of Lawson's writing goes a bit sour. By this time, he's getting bar money by writing... Um, verses to sell Heenzo cough syrup. You know, a few bob for a little, little bit of verse that goes into the bulletin and sells a bit of cough syrup. It was a sad time, apparently. And there is an autobiographical uh, story written from this time called the Ch A Child in a Dark, A Child in the Dark and a Foreign Father, at which he reflects on what it meant to grow up in his bush hut in his particular family. And he lays a lot of the blame for the problems in his life at the feet of not only women, but specifically his mother, Louisa Lawson. Now, when biographical critics have looked at the Lawson canon, they've tended to use that story as kind of, it speaks the truth. Aha, now we can see, with reference to this story, how Henry was turned into this kind of weak and unsuccessful and insecure creative genius by his mother's overwhelming influence. They use this story, written in 1902, to supplement their, this particular perspective. And it's been done by any number of, of um, biographers of Henry Lawson. But it's a reflection of an old and somewhat bitter man on a particular dimension of his childhood, written through his, the framework in which he was writing and the life experience he had in 1902. So, the writings do indicate a shift in perspective, and certainly by the end of his life, the critics say, with reference to this story, it was Louisa's fault. But I think that we need to look much further in the textual evidence before we jump to those kinds of conclusions. If women were in the bush world at all, they were often seen as hopelessly weak. Indeed, often the women were portrayed as going mad through their inability to cope with the power of the bush life. Other writers, like Edward Dyson, painted the same picture of inadequacy in the face of the harsh and threatening bush world. Yes, she was soon quite convinced that the animals and birds, even the insects that surrounded her, were mad, all of them. The bush was peopled with mad things. The wide wilderness of trees and the dull, dead grass and the cowering hills installed into every living thing that came under the influences of their ineffable gloom madness of melancholy. What is so easily overlooked in all this is that there had been many women writers well before the 1890s, popular and influential, or just recording the pioneering life. Why have their works been ignored or dismissed? Were they merely the soapies of their day? If we ask the question of whether these books were the equivalent of today's soapies, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, if, if you see soapies as being about personal lives and a set of characters we can identify with and uh, uh, everyday life being depicted, reflected back to us 
recognisable, then of course, yes, all of that is there. But if you mean by soapies, you, a trivialised version of that reality, then in, in the case of these books, no. They had serious um, purposes as well as entertainment. They were certainly popular because, I think, they fulfilled both the serious and the less serious functions. Certainly people are entertained by them, but also enormously informed by them as well. It is time then to start rewriting The Drover's Wife, to discover who she really was. And of course, here the mysteries begin. You need any help there, mate? It has been a mistake. What do you mean? Oh, it, uh, it isn't very important. This isn't the drover's wife. Look, this here's a Drysdale, mate. The drover's wife. No, she's not. She's my wife. Murray Bale's contemporary short story is part of an attempt to rewrite the now canonical oh, Lawson tale. Bale's husband still clearly sees the wife as property that has somehow got away from him. She uh, ran off 17 years ago. In a response to Henry Lawson, as well as to Bale, indeed to male writers of male stories, Barbara Jeffress goes much further. My version of The Drover's Wife was sparked off by the fact that the, um, the legend had already been used by four men. Uh, the legend, of course, was created by Lawson and his drover's wife was a very typical uh, Lawson heroine, very good, uh, very saint-like, very boring character that no modern woman can accept. And then there was the um, Drysdale painting which showed her as a uh, stark mother figure in a harsh landscape. Then Murray Bale wrote a, a story overturning the legend in a way, saying she wasn't really the rover's wife. She was his dentist character's wife who'd run off and, and left him with the kids. And then Frank Morehouse wrote a story uh, told by an Italian who believed there were no women in Australia for the first hundred years. So that was four men using the rover's wife as a symbol for Australian pioneer women. Um, and I thought it was my turn and perhaps her turn to be heard because nobody had written anything at all from the woman's point of view. Um, a lot of Australian writing, I think, does follow this male point of view and women just have to accept that if they can or get out of the way. Uh, my drover's wife didn't want to get out of the way. She wanted to be heard in her own right as somebody with an independent mind and strong feelings. And although she is an uneducated person, she's very powerfully convinced that women have a different history from men and that that has to be told. He didn't mean me any harm, <laughs> far from it. But men can only see women as heroines when they do something a decent man would do for them if he happened to be around, like killing a snake or an injured calf or hauling a rotting sheep carcass out of the well. I want to do great things, Gertie. I'll be a servant. I hate this life. You should never have left the mountains. It's not father's fault. You can't blame him for the drought. Gertie, don't you ever dream there's more to life than this? Don't you want to meet people who talk about books and words and have visions. Gertie, I can't settle for a new dress. Picnic now and then. Living out in the bush for the rest of my life. I might just as well be dead. Oh, say, don't say things like that. Well, why doesn't Mother understand? Why doesn't anyone? For the heroine, the choice was no choice at all. Stay on and marry or leave the bush or the country homestead life with all its attendant security and restrictions. It was a choice that author Miles Franklin herself had to make, only to find, as the title of her later book tells us, that my career goes bung. Right, the bush worker's wife. 
was in a comparable position to her city sisters in terms of law and formal rights, but the practical difficulties of her life were much greater. They were, these difficulties were produced by isolation, by lack of access to childcare. She was likely to have a higher fertility than her city sisters. She had less access to things like abortion, contraception, information. These made life quite difficult. As well, if there were difficulties in her marriage, such as drunkenness, domestic violence, marital rape, things like that, there was nobody to hear. The literal physical isolation made it difficult to proceed if there was any problem. This is not to say bush women were not tough people who negotiated their conditions of existence. It simply means that if they were unlucky, if they were in a bad situation, apropos a spouse, it would have been very difficult to get redress. Yep, Don't you bleed now yet? You're not gonna be walking again. I'm gonna have to do everything now. I've got a shitty mind to fill up. You can. Oh, can I? I'm not gonna slave my guts out over this bleeding plate. In her few stories, Barbara Bainton wrote of a world of unrelenting male cruelty that led to her being easily dismissed by many readers and critics as exaggerating or distorting realities. I think Barbara Bainton has been misunderstood in a number of ways. Uh, it's most commonly said that she hated the bush, and I vehemently deny that. If you read her work with any great care, she hates the harsh pieces of the bush and absolutely revels in the beauty of it at other times. I suppose she was criticised for painting a very harsh view of um, Australian outback life for women. How could she not? Because she lived there and found it extremely desensitising, mostly, but also for men and women. She thought the, the life of a poor settler was almost too harsh for them to emerge with any humanity at all. And she wrote about what she had experienced Obviously, she didn't experience rape and murder, or she wouldn't be around to write the story. But living as far out back as she did, she certainly heard a lot from the people around her. And, as I said, when she married into great ease, she, the, the experience just came flooding out of her. Um, I, I can't believe that they were too harsh. I think even if you looked around Australia now, just walking down the streets, the stories are worse than what she wrote about. I think Barbara Bankton is a terrific writer who also suffered uh, from bad press at the Times. What happened with Barbara Bainton is that she was writing Bush stories, but she was saying things that people didn't quite want to hear from a woman's perspective in the Bush, not from the heroic masculine stance of the Bush man as hero. And so at the time, people labeled her excessive, dissident, because she was saying not only what they didn't want to hear, but the label dissident meant, and what's not true either. And so the way she was received at the time bracketed her into this dissident category to preserve the masculine idealization of the Bush legend, which she certainly was writing against. There's another problem in that it's only in the last 10 years or so that we've had the critical literary tools to be able to appreciate Bainton, not as an excessive writer when judged against realism, but as a symbolic writer with psychological power and we can interpret her works as metaphors, her stories as metaphorical, not realistic, looking at what's absent, what's been suppressed, the, the presence of women, which activates male behavior in relation to female behavior in ways that couldn't be said before and couldn't be understood theoretically, because we needed the insights of psychoanalytic criticism and of reading symbolically, reading from metaphor, that have become current and, uh, and are in favor now in the last 10 years. So Barbara Bainton's um, uh, star has rocketed within Australia in the last 10 years or so because she's being read differently. The eyes of the sheep reflected the haze-opposed glory of the setting sun. Loyally they stood till a grey quilt swathed them. In their eyes glistened luminous tears materialized from an atmosphere of sighs. The wide plain gauzed into a sea on which the hut floated lonely. <laughs> 
Through its open door, a fire gleams like the red steaming mouth of an engine. Beyond the hut, a clump of miles looms spectral and wraith-like. And round them, a gang of crows called noisily, irreverent of the great silence. Leave off! Leave off! You bitch! Leave off! Though squeakers mate, the story offers a sense of some hope of redemption and justice. The film clearly does not. We have looked at many accounts of the formation of a national culture. We have noted the narrative of most leading historians as presenting a masculinist construction of identity. Further, we've seen how native Aborigines, white women and immigrants, particularly early on the Chinese on the goldfields, were all depicted, caricature, ignored as outside the mainstream of national development. This construction is derived from 19th century liberal philosophy and theology on the assumption that the state is a collective of white male individuals. There never was a time in all of the rec recordings of hist Australian history when any historian actually looked at the position of women in Australian culture. That happened within a six month period with two very, very powerful and dramatic books, one by Miriam Dixon called uh, The Real Matilda and the other one by Anne Summers called Damn Tours and God's Police. Anne Summers wrote her book from a socialist feminist perspective. So she looked at women as a colonized sex in Australia. Uh, and that perspective spoke to the kind of ideological concerns of the left and of most feminists here. Miriam Dixon, on the other hand, used psychological uh, theory, Erickson's identity theory, to ground her research and to frame her explanations for women's inferior status in Australia. And had that book come out in the US, I think it would have been much, um, uh, it would have been perceived as a much more valuable text because there was a ready audience for that kind of framework, an understanding of psychological theory and its relevance for cultural studies. But in Australia, um, there was a resistance to those kinds of explanations. And so that, among other reasons, was one, one of the um, reasons why I think Miriam Dixon's book hasn't had quite as much play as Anne Summers' uh, text, but both were very significant in their time and continue to influence cultural studies and historical studies even today, some 16 years later. And so the drover's wife is beginning to fade from the center of the legend, as the general readership in the last part of this century now has access, through an intensive publishing program, to a wide range of texts, literary, historical and analytical, about the contemporary reality of women. At last, the drover's wife can be seen in urban and suburban space. But still, society prefers to define her role in narrow, confining ways. Are you blaming me for fighting for something that belonged to me? Belonged to you? Is a woman yours because you fight like the animals of the earth? Hasn't a woman the right to choose her man? She chose me years ago. As a child, she did. But as a woman, she has chosen differently. Women could be seen as strong, but always as the unifying principle providing the base from which men could go out to work. If I'm so wrong, I'll clear out and leave it to the others. That's an easy way out for you. What do you expect me to do? I want you to stay here and work until your brother is strong again. For every tree you cut, I want you to cut one for Shane. For every foot of soil you plough, plough one for Shane. Then if you want to leave, leave clean and manly as an O'Riordan. But if you leave now with bitterness and jealousy in your heart, you break up something that your father has tried hard to build up all his life. And I won't allow that to happen. I won't have this family broken up, Barney. I won't have it, do you hear? Mother. But the images today are increasingly of independence of a valued experience that can even exclude or have no need of men, or indeed of families. You're a mother, you're a wife. You're my lover, you're our life. Don't underestimate it. Melody. You ought to be congratulated. Melody. You ought to be congratulated. Of course, in advertising, the good mother is still with us. Gordon? Kay? Gonna come in and join us all for a meal? Gordon? Please come in. You're very welcome. So much of recent cinema has dealt with women's urban realities that it seems the bush is receding at last. 
though there are leakages, hints of the old drover's wife emerging when you least expect them. May I? One thing is certain, while forging a life in the bush could be unendurably hard for men, women more often paid a higher price. I think the argument about the so-called uniquely low status of Australian women is set to undergo a fair bit of revision across the next decade or so. That revision is coming about as more Australian historians do comparative work in other countries that had a new settlement, had a frontier experience, and now have a highly urbanised, multicultural, modern society. The more comparison one does with the United States, with Canada, with New Zealand, with South Africa, uh, and other such countries, the clearer it becomes that frontier cultures produce conditions that are adverse for women. I think it might be the case that in the past, so horrified have historians been by what they found in the frontier for Australian women, that they've assumed no such condition applied elsewhere. I think the research base is too thin to call it this one yet, but I, th I have to confess to a certain scepticism about claims that Australian women had a uniquely low status. And I think at minimum, we have to be very clear about what our performance criteria are for what constitutes status. We don't just like it, we love it. We don't just like it, we love it. The rise of gender studies in universities, and even in schools, finds plenty of work to do in the deconstruction of that most potent field for myth-making, advertising. Well, I think there's an interesting uh, theory about that Australia is now becoming somewhat subservient in the international field, and that we're in danger of losing our own identity. Uh, in that broader kind of cultural um, sphere, sphere that we find ourselves in. And it's possible to make comparisons between that and the situation of women in Australia historically, who are regarded as, as having been invisible, as having been marginal, and whose role in creating Australia is unrecognised. But I think there are some dangers in that, and I think the danger is this that whereas you'll find in official histories and official documentary accounts, there is no uh, attempt to address women by and large until some of the recent feminist work. In fact, you find a lot of those histories are extremely dull and boring and don't tell you much either about how Australia developed as a form. But if you look at other cultural forms, novels, films, plays, books, music, poetry and so on, you find that there's a very strong sense of the role of women, what they did, the richness of their lives, how they complemented and supplemented the work of other people, and how they're essential in terms of establishing identity, in terms of developing different regions, in terms of making a mark on the economy, on Australia. So I suspect there's a bit of a danger of separating men and women's roles out as being totally separate and alien and having not much to do with each other in the same way that we're trying to set Australia as being separate, different and, uh, and isolated from the international context. That I think we probably have to see both in a much closer kind of attention and look at the way they interrelated and in a way they supported each other in a much more interactive kind of a process. Amen. Waratah and Enderby joined together for all time. Sending room to the world. Hoping to build a nation to the greatness our fathers dreamed of. It's a big job, Wayne. Yes. I'll be needing some young chaps to help me. Well, I suppose you could advertise for them, couldn't you?